Kajala Medical presents COVID-19 The Answers, the show that delivers the scientific evidence-based knowledge that can safely return us all to our pre-COVID lives. My name is Dr. Fumi Okanola and I'll be hosting the show. Every week you can listen to me interview a highly respected professional about the science that can reduce your risk of becoming infected with this coronavirus. Welcome to COVID-19 The Answers, Episode 7, an introduction to testing and the Saliva Direct story. I'd like to introduce you all to Dr. Anne Wiley, PhD, aka the Spit Queen. Dr. Wiley is a microbiologist and research scientist at the Department of Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases at the Yale School of Public Health at Yale University in the USA. Dr. Wiley completed her BSc in Biomedical Science at the University of Auckland in 2007, followed by a postgraduate diploma and master's in medical science in 2009 at the Auckland Cancer Research Centre at the University of Auckland. After being offered a job as a laboratory technician at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, she then went on to live in Amsterdam and began working on detecting the pneumococcus bacterium in saliva and converted her work into a PhD. This led on to a postdoctoral research post at Yale University as a continuum of her pneumococcal research in 2016. With the subsequent outbreak of the pandemic, Dr. Wiley turned her skills into developing a revolutionary new way of detecting SARS-CoV-2 in saliva that is safe, simple, scalable, and cost-effective with an open source protocol called Saliva Direct. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Anne, could you tell the audience where your fascination with the analysis of spit came from? Yeah, sure. So I've actually been working with saliva as a sample type for about uh, 10 or 12 years even now. And it all started when my PhD supervisor was actually combing through some historic literature back from the early 1900s. And as you mentioned, we were working on a bacteria, Streptococcus pneumoniae. And he found that in that literature, all of the research that they did was using saliva samples, yet somewhere between now and then, the gold standard nasopharyngeal swab had been introduced, and almost all of this research technique using saliva had just been lost away, this, uh, had been lost along the way somewhere. So my PhD really started out um, sort of revitalizing saliva as a sample type for pneumococcal carriage detection. Oh, that's great. Right, so moving on to the questions. So vaccination is the most effective tool uh, for reducing our risk of infection and disease during the COVID-19 pandemic, but we will not get ourselves out of this pandemic with vaccination alone. Testing is an often overlooked, misunderstood, but essential tool. At the very beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, the World Health Organization's Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, declared, we have a simple message for all countries test, test, test. Anne, I fully recognise that testing is a topic unto itself with different COVID tests for different circumstances and purposes, but could you please describe in general terms how a testing and isolation strategy works to drive down rates of infection during an outbreak? Why is testing an important tool in our bid to reduce the risk of SARS-CoV-2 infection? So unless we test, we don't actually know where the virus is. So testing is really important to identify individuals who are positive for the virus, they're carrying it, they might even have a very mild infection that they don't um, otherwise recognize. And so only by testing, we can find those individuals, alert them to their infection status, and hope that they will then take the necessary means to protect others. So whether that's indeed actually staying home from work, staying indoors, keeping away from family and friends, or even letting others know that they have potentially been exposed exposed. We're using other mitigation factors such as wearing a mask um, just to protect others if they do have to go out. So this is why we still need testing is to fully understand where the virus is and importantly to monitor how it might continue to change. Thank you and of course even though um, a significant proportion of us are vaccinated which does reduce our risk of passing on infection we can still pass on the virus. Exactly. 
There are nearly 3,000 tests internationally authorised for the detection of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. There are tests that measure a new or acute infection, such as the laboratory PCR, or rapid antigen tests, and those that measure an infection that happened some time ago by looking at your antibodies or T-cells. Some you can get an immediate result with, others it takes hours. We will be discussing rapid testing with Dr. Michael Miller next week. For the sake of this interview, we're going to focus on the laboratory-based PCR test, often described as the gold standard, and look, why, uh, look at why Saliva Direct is so revolutionary and the critical role Saliva Direct and similar processes to it should be playing on a global scale with regards to testing. At the beginning of the pandemic in early 2020, PCR testing was needed in every country on the globe to detect COVID as we all had so little information on this virus that we needed a test with a high degree of accuracy utilising a known technology. There were global shortages of key components. Can you please tell the audience what those shortages were and how this inspired you to devise the Saliva Direct protocol? Yes, of course. So, of course, very early on with the gold standard sample type defaulting to the nasopharyngeal swab, First and foremost, the nasopharyngeal swabs themselves fell in short supply. This was really amplified when a very early outbreak hit Italy very hard. And in Italy is where the one of the main distributors and manufacturers for nasopharyngeal swabs is based. So not only were nasopharyngeal swabs themselves in short supply, but thinking about the lab processes, there's so many different um, steps from taking that sample off the swab, sort of taking that sample, opening it up, finding the virus gen genetic material that you're wanting to target, amplifying that so you're actually able to detect it, and then having a way to read it out. So along that process, there are a lot of reagents and materials that are needed. So whether it's RNA extraction kits, meaning the reagents or the buffers, the chemicals that are needed to break down the sample in the virus, but even things like pipette tips. A pipette is a simple laboratory device that you use to move, um, you know, samples to uh, processing trays, to PCR plates, and the tips that go on the end of those those rapidly fell in short supply with you know millions of tests needing to be done around the world during this time so at basically every step of this process there were factors that were just indeed short falling in short supply at this time very early on in the pandemic there were also only a very small number of these reagents that were authorized for use for clinical diagnostic testing so the labs were having to draw from a very limited number of these reagents over the course of the pandemic the number of these that were authorized for use was expanded, but it took some time. So, of course, many labs pulling from the same supply chain just caused these supply chains to collapse. The pandemic shut down global societies and in particular, all major professional sports were cancelled. Prior to continuing their basketball schedule in spring 2020, the US National Basketball Association partnered with you to help bring the Saliva Direct protocol to market, enabling the NBA to continue playing regular season games while other professional sports were still on hold. Could you tell us how the NBA came to be involved with Saliva Direct and contributed to your research, both financially and practically? Yes, it was certainly a very surreal experience in May 2020 to receive an email from Robbie Seeker, the um, VP of Health at the Timberwolves. Um, you know, there were crazy things happening every day during the pandemic, but we certainly did not expect to be receiving an email from the NBA. Mm -hmm. So Robbie Seeker had reached out to us because he like us, he recognized that very early on there was going to be a need for frequent repeat testing and that, you know, having swabs on a daily basis was just, especially at this time, you know, the only swabs that were available were nasopharyngeal swabs. So having those even just once a week was not going to be a pleasant experience, wasn't going to encourage people to get testing. So while we had already showing the potential for SARS-CoV-2 det detection in saliva. He had been doing his research and he had seen that. So he came to us because he also wanted to see if there was a way that we could take what we had already found with saliva. And the NDA, um, much like us, was actually really focused on finding testing methods that could be made to be um, a lot less expensive, a lot more accessible to the general public. And so we actually told them that we were already looking at a way of taking the saliva sample, how to process it very cheaply in an effort to drive down testing costs. So we found that we already had this, 
so we found that we already shared these ideals and this is what really drove the partnership. So in the end, the National Basketball Association um, gave us a sponsored research agreement for $500,000 and that was to continue to develop Saliva Direct. So it really supported our staff during this process it supported the purchasing of the equipment and the reagents to do so, and it supported what we needed to do to take this idea, develop it into a test, and get an FDA emergency use authorization for it in the end. So where the NBA also came in to play with this is that they were still having their routine clinical diagnostic testing. So when the players were at home um, training for the playoffs, they were having a, a nasal swab, but they were also collecting a saliva sample for us and sending that to us at our lab to test just to see if we could further validate this along traditional diagnostic testing. Once they got to the bubble, the same thing happened. So in the bubble, the players were receiving their clinical diagnostic test, which was a paired anterior narrow swab, so one of the shallow nasal swabs, paired with an oral swab into the same tube. That was sent off to a diagnostic lab for their formal testing. But again, the NBA players, the staff, they were volunteering to be part of our research study and they were willingly giving us saliva samples, sending them back to the lab so that we could compare them to their clinical diagnostic testing just to see how Saliva Direct would fare out in the field. Um, so it was really just with their assistance that really helped to drive this development and help to produce a test that can make um, testing more accessible. The following set of questions will explain the difference between saliva direct and conventional PCR that we've just described. So Anne, with, re with reference to your research paper published in March 2021 in MED entitled Saliva Direct, a simplified and flexible platform to enhance SARS-CoV-2 testing capacity, you talk about several factors that need to be met for the implementation of frequent testing on a large scale. I'd like to look at each in turn and would ask you to explain how Saliva Direct meets those needs. So the first is safety. How does Saliva Direct meet this aspect? Well, the great thing about Saliva Direct is that the patient or the person who just wants to get tested to see you know, what their infection status is, is that the sample can be self-collected. They can do so in their own home. They can do so, you know, even if they're at a testing site, they can be handed a collection kit and they can just sit there. They can pull saliva themselves in their mask, you know, in their mouth, uh, behind their mask, removing it just uh, briefly to drool into the tube. So it's a very contained sample, whereas nasopharyngeal swabs, for example, they do require a trained healthcare professional to take them. They are, that means that the healthcare professional does have to get up very close to the patient. With these swabs being uncomfortable, it can potentially cause the patient to sneeze or cough onto the healthcare worker who's collecting the sample. So just the fact that individuals are able to take their own safety and negating that need for the healthcare professional can just um, help to decrease that risk of transmission from patient to healthcare worker. Fantastic. The second is affordability. Could you please outline the costs of implementing the Saliva Direct protocol in comparison to the costs of a conventional nasopharyngeal PCR test? So this was key. Uh, this, so this was key in our minds when developing Saliva Direct. We wanted to drive down prices as much as possible. So the first thing that we did is that we showed that SARS-CoV-2 RNA is very stable in saliva, that you don't need to have expensive sort of buffers that are marketed to, to stabilize that virus RNA to make it, um, to make sure that you'll be able to detect it after it's been sitting out for various times and temperatures. So we showed that, first of all, that you don't need those expensive buffers, which means that you don't need um, specialized collection devices. You can just use very generic laboratory plastic tubes, which are in the range of, you know, cents to dollars rather than being much more. Um, the next step of the process was to um, make the test itself cheaper. We identified early on that the most costly part of the whole PCR test is the RNA extraction step. It's longer, it requires more hands-on time from staff, and it requires, as I said, an array of different chemicals and reagents, and those can be incredibly costly. So what we wanted to see was, is RNA extraction even needed? So it was actually um, one evening I was setting up a PCR. We were doing our normal PCR testing, and I had some saliva samples from different COVID-19 inpatients sitting there. And I just thought I'd see what would happen if we put saliva 
straight into the PCR test itself. That's, you know, run at the back end after extraction usually. And we put those through the PCR and um, not all results were perfect by any means. Um, some outright failed, but some were perfect. So we got some like near identical results to as what we'd get if we did the full RNA extraction. And the fact that we even had some promising results while some very much failed, it was enough to, you know, um, give us the confidence that we should look into this further to see if we could fully remove that and how we can make every saliva sample being put into PCR um, run successfully. So what's the cost difference between um, uh, running a saliva direct protocol and a conventional nasopharyngeal uh, swab? Probably one of the more even expensive um, pieces rather than the RNA extraction itself is even sample collection. So paying for your healthcare worker to take that sample. I know in many countries that has been definitely the bulk of the cost, but that obviously usually comes from the governments or the um, healthcare systems who are providing um, you know, employment to those healthcare providers. If we look at the RNA extraction and PCR test alone, in our lab, we've seen that that can be around nine dollars just for the reagents um, and that doesn't you know incorporate um, the time of the laboratory technicians to run the test if you're thinking about clinical diagnostic labs it doesn't take into consideration their um, you know the cost for their infrastructure their you know building costs their taxes their insurances their uh, reporting, physician orders, those kind of things. But we talk about just the base needed for a normal RNA extraction PCR test, that's around $9. With Saliva Direct, getting rid of that, many of our labs can source the reagents for just $1 per test. So that can bring that test down. You know, if you're thinking about running hundreds of samples a day, thousands of samples a day, that can really start to make a difference. Right. Okay. So you're looking at at least a ninefold difference, really, between the exactly. tests. Right, which is significant. And also, I guess, if you're looking at um, uh, the, I think internationally now there's a shortage of healthcare professionals. So if you're cutting that step out of the whole process, that would, again, reduce the, um, the costs uh, significantly. Exactly. And it even just frees those healthcare professionals up to, you know, either if they're um, helping with vaccination drives or even just getting them back into the clinic for the normal sort of clinical needs that most of our communities need. And then um, the third property you stated in your paper is flexibility. Um, um, and I think you've gone through that because you've explained how you've um, really, you don't need as many reagents and that obviously eases the global su the supply chain. Um, and then the fourth um, in your paper was adaptability. So um, how does saliva, uh, can you talk, please talk about saliva direct adaptability to workflow? Saliva Direct is the first open source EUA that has been awarded by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA here in the US. What that means is that for every step of the protocol, we validated a range of different uh, reagents from different suppliers. Um, the PCR instrument, we validated the test on many different PCR instruments. I think we're up to about 23 different instruments right now. Um, we've also designed three different workflows where you, um, to process a saliva sample, you can either add a very simple enzyme or you can instead do a heat pretreatment step. And we also validated three different times and temperatures that labs can pick and choose from. Or you can also do a combination of both of those things. So we wanted to have adaptability or even flexibility in the system to allow labs to work to their existing workflows. We wanted this to be an easy lift for labs to implement. We wanted to enable them to use their existing infrastructure so that they didn't have to buy any additional instruments because of course those costs would only be passed on to the public. We wanted them to be able to utilize their existing supply chains for the um, PCR reagents that were required. So if they could go to the supplier that they already worked with, they're more likely to get better prices, especially if they're ordering in bulk. It also creates competition between the different suppliers that we have in there that we're not just recommending one simple um, supplier. And it also creates um, redundancy or, so, or if there has been any other supply chain disruptions where one product is suddenly not available, we have others there that the labs can choose from. So we've really, this has really been key to us and it's really driven the 
um, evolution of our protocol. So if a lab comes to us and says, hey, we actually have a instrument in our lab that's not on your EUA right now, can you help us? Can it get on there? And we actually do these bridging studies that we can show that does the instrument perform as well as the other instruments that we already have on there, yes or no. And if it does perform just as well, we can submit that data to the FDA and then this instrument will be permitted to be run with our assay as well. And so through this, we continue to um, further develop, um, make it more accessible to more labs around the country. Oh, that's great. Um, and then turnaround time. Um, I mean, this is just a really important property. I mean, very often when you do a nasopharyngeal swab, particularly if you, you know, if you're in the middle of an outbreak, you can wait two, three, four days uh, for your result. Um, so, what's the turnaround time for saliva direct in in comparison to conventional PCR? So we remove the RNA extraction step, which is one of the longest stages of the whole PCR test. So it does reduce it probably about by a third. But what's more important here is that we have really focused on community testing. Um, through this, we have um, we have already designated 173 labs in 41 states across the US to test under the Saliva Direct EUA. And so many of these are serving their local communities, their local schools, their local workplaces. And I think it's that local testing that's really key to test turnaround time. So if you can just take your sample down the road, um, that you know already cuts out, you know, there's many labs that ship their samples from all around the country and that alone can lead to delays. And that can also mean that they're receiving thousands of samples from all over the country, whereas the local labs are essentially likely to be receiving slightly less. So a lot of our labs, um, well, some of the labs actually report back in about four to six hours. Many of the labs can return results within 12 hours and the vast majority of samples um, get reported within about 24 hours. That's fantastic. And is that even in the middle of an outbreak that they're able to achieve those, those figures? I mean, certainly in outbreaks, um, you know, in these surges, it can vary. I mean, you know, I, I think during an outbreak, I mean, this is the thing that we've got to keep in mind is also what test demand is. So I would say that in an outbreak, all of those times get pushed back a little bit because, of course, the staff are being inundated by, you know, many more samples that are coming through. But again, this is such a streamlined procedure. We also um, have um, permitted pooling, so labs can also pool up to five samples to help with sample throughput as well. Um, so yeah, it can get a little bit delayed, um, but certainly we've never seen anything um, more than sort of 48, 72 hours, whereas, you know, at other labs, it's been, you know, more like six, seven, 10, 12 days, even at times. Yeah, by which time the test would become useless. Exactly. Could you please explain to the audience um, in terms that they can relate to what sensitivity means in relation to a testing process? Sensitivity is referring to just how few copies of the virus that a test is able to detect. So a more sensitive test is able to detect much fewer copies of the virus or the virus RNA, whereas a less sensitive test means that it's going to take more of that virus to be present in you before that test will return a positive result. Okay, so you're looking at, a th so the idea is to have a test that's highly sensitive, um, that's able to accurately to test, uh, detect whether you have COVID or not, whether you're truly positive to COVID, is that correct? Exactly. So, um, so um, can you please compare the sensitivity of saliva direct with the nasopharyngeal PCR test? Um, yeah, happy to. And actually the um, FDA really helped us with that. So first of all, when you apply for your emergency use authorization, when you're showing how well your test works, that's all data that's being generated from the lab. But of course, every lab has sort of, you know, sort of interlab variations in some of their detection methods, how things work, maybe the samples that they were working from. So the FDA actually sent out a blinded panel of samples to all of its EUA holders at the time. So, you know, labs around the country, test manufacturers around the country were receiving this blinded panel. We had no idea what was in there. What we had to do is test those samples in our test, exactly in our test protocol that you have, and report those results back to the FDA. 
and they would let you know what the sensitivity or the limit of detection of your test was. So it was very exciting to see that um, Saliva Direct actually has the same recorded limit of detection or sensitivity as the CDC's, the US CDC's own PCR assay. And the CDC's own PCR assay with nasopharyngeal swabs uses RNA extraction. So we were able to use saliva we were able to take out RNA extraction and we maintained that same level of sensitivity as the CDC's own assay. And in layman's terms, uh, what you're basically saying is, is that your protocol, your saliva direct protocol was just as accurate, just as reliable um, um, as a, as a, as a um, laboratory-based, um, what I say, PCR test is the conventional PCR test. That's correct. Excellent. So with the unique medical properties of saliva, the ease of sampling, the low costs, the ability to increase um, testing, I, I, I've heard that you can increase testing with something like Saliva Direct by a factor of 10. Um, why isn't saliva and the type of protocol that Saliva Direct utilizes used everywhere? So saliva is not a traditional diagnostic sample type. The nasopharyngeal swab has been the gold standard sample type, or even the oropharyngeal swab in some cases, for respiratory virus detection um, for decades now. And so this means that many labs aren't used to collecting saliva, they're not used to processing it. And if you do not have good clear collection instructions, what you get might not be saliva. So you know, what we've developed through our protocol is that we've really identified that it's just your normal true saliva that pulls in your mouth. You know, if you were to take, if you were to swallow everything out of your mouth right now, you know, we're not asking you to cough anything or sniff anything up, you know, make any movement in your throat. If you just sit there, that's just your normal saliva that just gradually pulls back into your mouth. And that's what we want. And when you actually collect that versus anything sort of deeper or, you know, maybe a bit, uh, thicker or stickier, it is, can be very, very easy um, to process. And we've seen that. I mean, you know, when we gave the protocol to the National Basketball Association, for example, we received 3,800 samples back from the National Basketball Association. You know, we haven't given them our direct instructions on how to give it, um, you know, verbally or giving them, you know, showing them anything. It was all written. And I think there were only 12 samples, I believe it was, that we, that weren't quite uh, suitable for testing, but the rest of those 3,800 were. And we also see this, that with the labs um, who are now testing all over the US, you know, there have been well over 4 million saliva direct tests that have been run around the country. And very, a very, very, like a fraction of a percentage, you know, sort of more in the range of 0.5, 0.8% of those samples um, are rejected or cannot be tested, showing that people are able to collect good saliva samples and that labs have had a lot of success in testing following these protocols. So really it's a matter of changing hearts and minds and, and getting people to adapt, accept a modern way uh, of testing really rather than you know kind of an old-fashioned way that they've been used to. Exactly. Um, yeah so um, so Saliva Direct appears to be a game-changing testing protocol, part of the solution that would help us to live with COVID-19 safely. Um, so could you please share with the audience the future plans for Saliva Direct or similar protocols internationally? Low and middle income countries that don't have access to vaccines could enormously benefit from this technology. Is there a strategy in place to facilitate access for them? We're certainly working hard on that. You know, we're um, reaching out to PAHO, um, for example. We're reaching out to um, uh, collaborators, people in other countries. We still have to go through every single different country's regulatory um, agencies. So if you're, that can be a very um, complicated and timely process. But it's been really inspiring to see a number of countries around the world who have actually independently validated Saliva Direct. So we had no idea that they were experimenting with it, that they were testing with it, and you find it either in news articles or um, in academic research papers. So the Philippines Red Cross, for example, implemented Saliva Direct because they only had swabs otherwise um, available to them. And by providing Saliva Direct, they were actually able to provide much cheaper test options. Thinking forward and what we've learned and how easy this is, um, it's, certainly it's certainly suitable for um, low and middle income countries, the idea that you can use very generic laboratory materials, that the say, SARS-CoV-2 RNA is very stable in saliva without any expensive buffers or preservatives, meaning that you don't need to specialize collection devices, 
you don't need cold chain transport, which can be um, quite expensive. And indeed, if you can improve the acceptability of sampling, you know, if people are much happier to provide their own saliva sample rather than, you know, potentially even fearing a nasopharyngeal swab, it can help encourage testing. And recognizing that, you know, as our communities reopen, uh, travel resumes, you know, we are going to see the return of the other respiratory pathogens that we usually have each season. So thinking about the likes of influenza, for example, another common virus that affects children in particular, RSV. So what we would like to do is to be able to expand saliva direct to test other respiratory viruses. Um, you know, there are many other great tests out there that can detect these already, um, but they can, again, be more expensive, more goes into them, less stable in, um, uh, you know, more difficult settings to sample in. So we're hoping that if we can still develop a test that is accessible, it's acceptable, and um, can, you know, more cheaply identify many of these other viral pathogens that we have out there, that this could continue to change, you know, the public health landscape. Oh, that's that's fantastic. I love the way that um, you've developed a protocol that's really adaptable, um, so um, able to utilize what labs have locally um, and is so much more cheap. And from my understanding, um, uh, which I really would like to emphasize with the audience, is that um, I know, for example, that uh, about 50,000 PCR tests can be processed from a central laboratory a day. I mean, with Saliva Direct, um, my understanding is you could maybe produce 10 times that number. Um, and, and I guess from a local lab, am I correct in saying that? Really hard one to estimate because it all does depend on, you know, how many PCR instruments there are, how many staff there are. Um, there have been some incredible examples of testing programs around the country. Ohio State University has probably done close to a million saliva direct tests themselves, and they have tested at a rate that's higher than many of the states around them, and it's, you know, projected to save them millions of dollars. So, you know, there have been very, there's been many very successful testing programs, but, um, you yeah, know, it's hard to say what the exact uh, scale-up factor would be but it is significant. Dr. Uh, Gabriasis, the Director General of the World Health Organization, expressed serious concern that many countries are drastically reducing COVID-19 testing, inhibiting the ability of public health professionals to monitor the coronavirus, how it's spreading and how it's evolving. Clearly, SARS-CoV-2 has been and will continue to form new variants in order to survive and thrive. And what are your thoughts on the reduction of meaningful testing and its potential impact on the virus going forward? It's, a, it's quite a scary prospect, to be honest. I mean, again, we still need testing. We still need to understand where the virus is in our community, who it's affecting, and certainly how it's evolving. Um, this is something that I'm really hoping that Saliva Direct can potentially play a role in. I mean, being such a low-cost test can help make testing more sustainable. So, you know, we're really talking with our laboratory partners around the country. And again, as you said, like thinking about overseas, where do we need to have sustainable testing programs? And can they use something like Saliva Direct that's so low cost to make sure that we at least have some level of testing going on in our community? Because we need to have that testing maintained to some degree so that we can get, you know, an early warning signal if there are outbreaks that are happening. Um, indeed, if there are any variants of, new, you know, emerging variants of concern that we need to be worried about. Um, you know, if we just stop everything altogether, I think we're going to see, yeah, there'll be quite some devastating effects. Looking at your website, um, the Saliva Direct um, as a protocol is now available for free throughout the USA. Um, can you please tell us how this was achieved and to what degree these protocols are being implemented in comparison to conventional PCR testing? I mean, you've touched on this a bit. I mean, I guess um, the way that you've managed to get local labs to utilize your protocol was a big factor too. Yes, that's right. So, I mean, first and foremost, um, the development of Saliva Direct was to increase the access to low-cost testing. Like very early on in the pandemic, it was obviously those who were symptomatic who could get tested, but otherwise it was those who could afford it. And in so many places, tests were going for anywhere from, you know, $100, $150 a test. So indeed, we were focused on making Saliva Direct as low-cost as possible. And we knew from the outset that 
for that reason, we could have absolutely no costs affiliated with it on our side. So, you know, for that reason, we don't make anything, we don't distribute anything, we don't have any licensing agreements, you know, indeed our protocol means that we send all of these labs directly to the suppliers to get their reagents because that way they can get the lowest cost possible. We knew that any cost that we added to it, you know, an agreement fee, licensing fee, those costs would only be passed on to the public around them. And that's exactly what we were wanting to avoid as anything to drive these um, test price up further. Um, and, you know, this I think has, you know, I think many of the labs who have joined our network, again, we've yeah, designated 173 labs in 41 states across the US at the moment, is that so many of those have um, either aligned to our mission, you know, they've also wanted to be able to increase testing to their local communities, and that's reflected on the very low cost um, tests that they offer. There's even been a lab that's actually offered saliva direct testing for free because of, you know, what was coming in um, from their other tests and that saliva direct was so cheap, they were able to just, um, yeah, offer that for free. Um, uh, That's great. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, in Canada, people, depending on whether we're in the middle of an outbreak or not, a conventional uh, nasopharyngeal PCR test can cost anywhere from 100 to $300 per test. I mean, so, um, and it sounds like those are the kinds of figures that you have in the US, but in US dollars. So free is obviously fantastic. Do you know on average how, how much people are being charged for a saliva direct test? Yeah, again, it really depends on lab and the testing programs that they're doing. But, you know, we have some labs who charge sort of anywhere from about $15 to $25 for a saliva direct PCR test. Um, we have those that just due to how the sort of um, reimbursements go through insurance are chart, you know, they are priced at about the $59 sort of dollar. It's been disappointing to see that there is the odd lab that still charges $100, $150 for a test. Um, you know, it's you know, that's sort of been the more frustrating end of it, but the vast majority are offering Saliva Direct at a much lower cost than, you know, many of the other big labs out there. So the costs, um, you know, the ability to process the test much quicker, all of these things, I mean, in my opinion, it should be used everywhere. Um, it's just fantastic. Where do you think your Saliva uh, Direct protocol can go um, with regards to the future? How else do you think it could be used? Yeah, I'm really excited to think about the opportunities that it might open up. I mean, right now, the public, the general public is so much no more knowledgeable about testing and also more acceptable about testing. I mean, so many schools have been such willing participants and understood the importance of testing and they're used to it now that, you know, could we go into schools once or twice a year from now on and collect a very easy saliva sample, you know, non-invasive, not much of a hassle to do but then screen it for other health markets, you know, which children are being exposed to lead, for example, which children have maybe ongoing concussions that haven't been properly detected. You know, what else can we be looking for that if we can do more public health screening, just improve the overall health of our communities? Oh, that's fantastic. So um, uh, I'd like to thank you, Anne, for joining us today. Um, uh, I have a personal sense of real pride that a woman has discovered and developed such a groundbreaking protocol that has and will continue to save so many lives on this planet. You're an inspiration to all and have held the banner high for women in science. Thank you so much. That's really lovely. I very much appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me and helping get these messages out as well. Um, Please join us next week for our interview with Dr. Michael Minner on rapid testing and an interview with Professor David Harris of Arizona University in the USA on accounts of rapid testing in the field. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of COVID-19 The Answers. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate and review and do visit our website kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19 The Answers.